In the annals of history, there have been tales of terror and malevolence, but none quite as chilling as the story of one woman who unleashed a reign of darkness upon America. Brace yourselves for the harrowing tale of Belle Gunness, a name that echoes through time as America's most degenerate female serial killer. Belle Gunness was born in Norway and sought a new life in the United States. But little did anyone know the sinister path she would carve, concealed beneath her charming smile and seemingly gentle demeanor was a heart as cold as ice. She cunningly lured unsuspecting suitors to her farm, offering love and companionship only for their journey to become a one-way ticket to damnation. Mysteriously, one by one, these suitors vanished, leaving no trace of their existence. As rumors of disappearances spread, suspicion inevitably fell upon this enigmatic woman. However, it wasn't until a gruesome discovery on her Laporte, Indiana, farmhouse property that the full extent of her heinous acts came to light. The farmhouse transformed into a chamber of horrors, concealing a grim graveyard of victims. Shocking estimates suggest that Belle Gunness may have murdered over 40 people, including her own children, all in pursuit of insurance money and personal gain. Throughout history, male serial killers have dominated the spotlight but Belle Gunness shattered that mold. Her malevolence demonstrated that evil knows no gender, leaving an indelible mark on the annals of crime. Join us as we plunge into the chilling chronicle of America's most degenerate female serial killer. Prepare yourself for a descent into the abyss of Belle Gunness's twisted psyche, a tale of horror and deception that will leave you questioning the true nature of malevolence. Welcome to the haunting narrative of Belle Gunness, a name destined to forever haunt the corridors of history. Belle Gunness, originally named Brynhild Paulsdatter Storseth, was born on November 11, 1859, in Selbu, saw Trondelag, Norway, to parents Paul and Berit Storseth. She was the youngest of eight siblings. At the age of 14, she started working on neighboring farms, helping with milking and herding cattle. An Irish TV documentary by Anne Buried Vespi, aired on September 4, 2006, includes a widely circulated, though unverified, story about Belle Gunness's early life. According to this tale, in 1877, while she was pregnant, Gunness attended a country dance where she suffered an assault by a man from a wealthy family. The attack caused her to miscarry, but the man faced no prosecution by the Norwegian authorities. Following this incident, those who knew her noticed a marked change in her personality. Coincidentally, the man who assaulted her passed away shortly after, reportedly due to stomach cancer. Belle Gunness was described as being approximately 1.7 meters, 5 feet 7 inches tall, and weighing around 95 to 113 kilograms, 210 to 250 pounds, possessing a strong and somewhat masculine appearance. Having grown up in poverty, Gunness decided to work on a large and prosperous farm the following year. For three years, she diligently saved money for her journey to the United States. In 1881, she successfully immigrated and decided to change her first name to Belle during the immigration process at Castle Garden. Her destination was Chicago, where her sister Nellie had already settled after immigrating several years earlier. In Chicago, Belle lived with her sister and brother-in-law, initially working as a domestic servant. Later, she secured a job at a butcher's shop, where her responsibilities included cutting animal carcasses. It was there that she met Mads Ditlev Anton Sorensen, her first husband, and they married in 1884. Unfortunately, their life together was marked by several tragic events. Alongside Sorensen, Gunness operated a confectionery store, which tragically burned down shortly after its establishment. Within their marriage, they had four children named Caroline, Axel, Myrtle, and Lucy. However, both Caroline and Axel passed away during infancy, purportedly due to severe colitis. Strangely, the symptoms of acute colitis align with signs of various forms of poisoning, raising suspicion. Furthermore, reports suggest that both Caroline and Axel had life insurance policies, which were ultimately paid out. In another unfortunate incident, their home also succumbed to fire in 1900. 
similar to the previous occurrence, Gunnus and Sorison were able to profit from the insurance money. Then, on July 30, 1900, tragedy struck again when Sorensen suddenly died from a cerebral hemorrhage. Coincidentally, it was noted that this was the only day when two life insurance policies overlapped. The initial doctor suspected strychnine poisoning, but the family doctor, who had been treating Sorensen for an enlarged heart, concluded that his demise resulted from heart failure. No autopsy was conducted as the death was deemed non-suspicious. Gunness informed the doctor that she had administered medicinal powders to her late husband to alleviate his condition. Curiously, she applied for the insurance money immediately after Sorensen's funeral. Relatives of Sorensen alleged that Gunness poisoned her spouse in order to collect the insurance funds. Although records imply that an investigation was ordered, it remains unclear if it was executed or if Sorensen's body was exhumed, as requested by his relatives, to test for arsenic poisoning. In the end, Gunness, the widow, received payments from both policies. The insurance companies granted her $8,500, equivalent to approximately $308,700 in today's currency, enabling her to purchase a farm located on the outskirts of Laporte, Indiana. Belle Gunness embarked on a new chapter in her life by leaving the city with her daughters Myrtle and Lucy, accompanied by a foster daughter named Jenny Olsen. With her newfound wealth, Gunness purchased a vast 48-acre farm in La Porte, Indiana, where she sought to make a fresh start. Soon after settling into her newfound sanctuary, Gunness found herself crossing paths with Peter Gunness, a fellow Norwegian widower and father of two daughters. On that fateful day, April 1, 1902, they joined together in matrimony within the confines of Laporte. However, misfortune seemed to follow Belle Gunness once again. A mere week after their wedding, tragedy struck when Peter's infant daughter perished under mysterious circumstances while alone with Belle in their house. Then, in December 1902, Peter himself met a tragic fate. Belle provided conflicting accounts initially claiming that he suffered scalding burns while reaching for his slippers near the kitchen stove. Later, she altered her story, alleging that a fatal head injury occurred when a part of a sausage grinding machine fell on him from a wobbly high shelf. Consequently, Peter's brother assumed custody of his older daughter, leaving Swan Hilda as the sole survivor from their time spent with Belle. Gunness profited from her husband's death, acquiring another $3,000 some sources suggest $4,000. However, the locals couldn't help but harbor suspicions, considering Peter's expertise in butchery and his competence in running a hog farm on the property. The district coroner, after reviewing the case, firmly concluded that Peter's death was a result of foul play, leading to the formation of a coroner's jury to delve deeper into the matter. Meanwhile, 14-year-old Jenny Olson, overheard by a classmate, supposedly confessed, my mama killed my papa. She hit him with a meat cleaver and he died. Don't tell a soul. Jenny was brought before the coroner's jury, but denied ever making such a statement. Meanwhile, Gunness managed to convince the coroner of her innocence. She conveniently omitted the fact that she was pregnant, a detail that could have evoked sympathy. In May 1903, Gunness gave birth to a baby boy named Philip. Later, in late 1906, Belle informed her neighbors that her foster daughter, Jenny Olson, had departed for a Lutheran college in Los Angeles, or, in some versions, a finishing school for young ladies. Belle continued to run her farm between 1903 and 1906, and in 1907, she hired a single farmhand, Ray Lamphere, to assist with daily chores. However, rumors began to circulate, suggesting that Belle's association with Lamphere was not merely professional. While many in town saw her as a robust woman, often seen donning men's overalls and adept at handling her own hog slaughtering, Lamphere knew a different side of her. He boasted, while under the influence of alcohol, about being intimately involved with his employer. But Lamphere's companionship was not enough to satisfy Belle's desires. Twice, widowed and residing on a vast farm in scenic Laporte County, Indiana, Gunness was on a quest to find a suitable life partner. She cunningly placed marriage ads in Norwegian Language newspapers across the Midwest, each had radiating charm and mystery. The ads state, Personal, a comely widow who owns a large farm in one of the finest districts in Laporte County, Indiana, desires to make the acquaintance of a gentleman equally well provided with a view to joining fortunes. 
no replies by letter are considered unless the sender is willing to follow up with a personal visit. Triflers need not apply. Her enticing advertisements attracted the attention of well-to-do, middle-aged men. Among the respondents was Henry Goholt, a farmhand from Wisconsin. Goholt traveled to Laporte and expressed his admiration for the farm in a letter to his family. He even requested seed potatoes. However, after this initial correspondence, he vanished without a trace. Concerned, his family reached out to Gunners, who claimed that Goholt had left with horse traders bound for Chicago. Another man, John Moe from Elbow Lake, Minnesota, also answered Gunness's ad. Moe arrived with over $1,000 to pay off her mortgage, or so he claimed to his acquaintances. Gunness introduced him as her cousin. However, shortly after his arrival, Moe disappeared from the farm. Soon after, George Anderson, an immigrant from Norway and a resident of Tokyo, Missouri, responded to Gunness's call. During a dinner conversation, Gunness brought up her mortgage predicament with Anderson. She proposed that if they decided to marry, he would assume responsibility for paying it off. That night, Anderson awoke to find Gunness standing over him, holding a flickering candle with a disturbing, enigmatic expression. Without uttering a word, she swiftly left the room. Frightened by this bizarre incident, Anderson fled from the house and took a train back to Missouri, a decision that likely saved both his life and fortune. Despite the unsettling occurrences, more suitors continued to arrive at the Gunness farm. However, none, except for Anderson, ever left. By this time, Gunness had started receiving large trunks at her home. Clyde Sturgis, a hack driver, vividly recalled delivering these colossal trunks from Laporte. He marveled at Gunness's physical strength as she effortlessly lifted and carried them, likening the act to handling lightweight boxes of marshmallows. The shutters of her house remained closed day and night and witnesses claimed to have seen her digging in the hog pen during the dark hours. The following individual in the sequence was Ole B. Budsberg, an elderly widower from Iola, Wisconsin. His last sighting was at the Laporte Savings Bank on April 6, 1907, where he mortgaged his Wisconsin land, signing over a deed and obtaining several thousand dollars in cash. Unbeknownst to his sons, Oscar and Matthew Budsberg, he had ventured to visit Gunness. When the truth surfaced, they reached out to her, seeking answers, only to receive a prompt response, denying any knowledge of him. Throughout 1907, Gunness Farm saw the arrival and abrupt disappearance of several middle-aged men. However, in December of that year, Andrew Helgelian, a bachelor farmer from Aberdeen, South Dakota, reached out to her. Their correspondence blossomed, and a particular letter written in Gunness's own handwriting, dated January 13, 1908, overwhelmed Helgelian. In the letter, she expressed her happiness, professing her strong affection for him and longing for their companionship, in which she wrote, To the dearest friend in the world, no woman in the world is happier than I am. I know that you are now to come to me and be my own. I can tell from your letters that you are the man I want. It does not take one long to tell when to like a person. And you, I like better than anyone in the world. I know. Think how we will enjoy each other's company. You, the sweetest man in the whole world. We will be all alone with each other. Can you conceive of anything nicer? I think of you constantly when I hear your name mentioned and this is when one of the dear children speaks of you or I hear myself humming it with the words of an old love song. It is beautiful music to my ears. My heart beats in wild rapture for you. My Andrew, I love you. Come prepare to stay forever. Responding to her heartfelt letter, Helgelian wasted no time and flew to her side in January 1908, carrying a check for $2,900 from his savings. Together, they appeared at the savings bank in Laporte and deposited the check. However, shortly after, Helgelian mysteriously vanished. Despite his absence, Gunness visited the savings bank again, making a $500 deposit and another of $700 in the state bank. Around this time, she began to experience difficulties with Ray Lamphere, the hired hand. Ray Lamphere, infatuated with Gunness, had become her loyal servant, willing to perform any gruesome task for her. However, as more suitors arrived to court Gunness, Lamphere's jealousy grew uncontrollable and he began causing scenes. His behavior reached a breaking point and on February 3, 1908, Gunness finally fired him. Seizing an opportunity to protect her interests, 
Gunness manipulated the local authorities into holding a sanity hearing for Lamphere, hoping to discredit any potential accusations he might make against her. Despite being declared sane, Lamphere remained an unsettling presence in her life, returning to her farm and issuing thinly veiled threats. Frustrated by his persistent advances, Gunness took matters to the sheriff, reporting him for trespassing on her property. She painted him as a dangerous man who posed a threat to her and her family, leading to Lamphere's arrest. However, Lamphere's tenacity was unparalleled. Despite being driven away time and again, he continued to return like a shadow haunting her every move. In one chilling conversation with farmer William Slater, he cryptically spoke of fixing someone named Helgelian for keeps. This Helgelian had vanished, and though many believed he had left the area, his brother, Asley Helgelian, suspected something more sinister. Deeply concerned for his missing brother, he penned a letter to Gunness, seeking answers. In a calculated response, Gunness claimed that Helgelian had likely gone to Norway to visit relatives. Her evasive response only fueled his suspicions, leaving him convinced that the truth lay hidden in La Pau, the place his brother had last been seen or heard from. Undeterred, Belle brazenly offered to assist in the search, but not without a catch. She cautioned Isley that finding missing people was a costly endeavor, hinting that he would need to pay for her efforts if she were to be involved. Determined to find the truth, Osley Helgeyan made the journey to Indiana in May to investigate further. The situation grew more perilous for Gunness with Lamphere's lingering presence and Aisley's inquiries. On April 27, 1908, she confided in M.E.E. Lilita, a lawyer, and took measures to safeguard her estate by creating a will, leaving everything to her children. Afterward, she paid off the mortgage on her property held by a Laporte bank. Surprisingly, she chose not to involve the police in reporting Lamphere's threatening behavior, leading many to speculate that there was a more sinister motive behind her actions. On the same day, Gunness bought two gallons of kerosene and toys for her children, leaving an eerie sense of foreboding in the air. In the early hours of April 28, 1908, Joe Maxson, who had taken over Lamphere's position in February that year, was awakened by the smell of smoke in his second-floor room at the Gunness house. Upon opening the hall door, he was confronted with a blaze engulfing the area. Maxson urgently called out for Gunness and her children but received no response. He managed to escape the fire by leaping out of his window in his underpants and hurried to town, seeking help. Regrettably, when the firefighters arrived at dawn, the farmhouse had already turned into a smouldering ruin and they discovered four bodies inside. Unfortunately, one of the bodies, that of a woman, couldn't be immediately identified as Gunness due to the absence of her head, which was never found. The children's bodies were found in their beds. County Sheriff Smutzer, who was already aware of Lamphere's alleged threats, connected the incident to him and brought him in for questioning. Despite denying any involvement in the fire and asserting he was not near the farm during the incident, Lamphere's alibi was challenged by a witness named John Soliem. Soliem came forward, stating that he saw Lamphere fleeing from the Gunners' house just before the fire erupted. Lamphere tried to dismiss the claim, but Soliem persisted, revealing that Lamphere had previously threatened him, compelling him to hide in the bushes. Consequently, Lamphere was arrested and charged with murder and arson. A thorough investigation commenced, with numerous personnel, including investigators, sheriff's deputies, coroners, and volunteers, meticulously searching the ruins for evidence. The shocking discovery of a headless woman's body in the town of Laporte sent waves of concern through the community. People who knew Belle Gunness, including C. Christopherson, L. Nicholson, and Mrs. Austin Cutler, were quick to deny that the remains belonged to her, as if that wasn't enough. Two additional acquaintances, Mrs. May Orlander and Mr. Sigurd Olson, arrived from Chicago and concurred that the body was not Gunnis's. Eager to unravel the truth, doctors delved into their scientific expertise to verify the identity. They meticulously measured the remains, factoring in the missing head and neck. The results pointed to a woman who stood 1.6 meters 5 feet 3 inches tall and weighed no more than 68 kilograms. 150 pounds, but there was a striking contrast in opinion. Numerous friends, neighbors, and local clothiers who had dressed Gunners for years insisted that she was a taller, more substantial woman 
measuring around 1.73 meters, 5 feet 8 inches, and weighing between 82 kilograms, 180 pounds, and 91 kilograms, 200 pounds. The disparity only fueled the mystery further. Unruffled by the conflicting accounts, the authorities sought to strengthen their case with tangible evidence. They meticulously compared the detailed measurements of the body with records from various Laporte stores where Belle Gunness had been a regular customer. The meticulous scrutiny led them to an astonishing conclusion. The headless woman could not possibly be the infamous Belle Gunness, regardless of the fire's devastating impact on the body, which remarkably remained intact. Dr. J. Myers conducted further examinations, delving into the internal organs of the deceased woman. The stomach contents were sent to a pathologist in Chicago, who delivered a startling report that came back months later, painting a sinister picture. The organs contained lethal doses of strychnine, pointing to a grave possibility. The woman had been poisoned. Upon learning about the devastating fire through the newspaper, Isley Helgelian was determined to journey to Laporte in search of his missing brother. On a fateful day, May 4, he walked into the Laporte Sheriff's office, desperately seeking any information that could lead him to Andrew's whereabouts. He confided in Sheriff Smutzer, expressing his suspicion that foul play might be involved, possibly at the hands of the infamous Belgunness. Asla Helgelian had stumbled upon a series of intriguing letters exchanged between his brother, Andrew Helgelian, and Bell Gunness. These letters contained suspicious requests from Gunness urging Andrew to relocate secretly to Laporte, carrying his money along and ensuring utmost secrecy. Driven by determination to uncover the truth, Sheriff Smutzer accompanied Asla to the Gunness house to investigate further. Amidst the ashes and wreckage left by the fire, they searched for any shred of evidence that could shed light on Andrew's whereabouts. For a time, Asla Helgelian assisted the police as they sifted through the debris, hoping to find even the faintest clue. Despite the overwhelming devastation, he couldn't bring himself to leave without exhausting every avenue in the search for his brother. Returning to the cellar, Asla approached Joe Maxson, the farmhand in the employee of the Gunness family, seeking any information that might lead them closer to the truth. Asley inquired about any peculiar occurrences during the spring, specifically if Joe knew of any holes or disturbed earth in the vicinity. Astonishingly, Joe Maxson confirmed such occurrences, revealing that Bell Gunness had tasked him with covering dozens of soft depressions, claiming they were mere covers for discarded trash. Eager to unravel the truth, Asler Helgelian and the farmhand began to excavate a pile of soft dirt in the hog pen not knowing what they would stumble upon. What they uncovered left them horrified beyond words. In the depths of that grim pile of dirt lay the remains of Andrew Helgelian, his head, hands, and feet concealed within an oozing gunny sack. Sheriff Smutzer led a team of 12 men back to the Gunness farm and initiated a thorough investigation. Upon investigation, they discovered numerous slumped depressions scattered throughout the Gunness yard. Deeper digging revealed the horrifying truth. Burlap sacks containing dismembered body parts, such as torsos, hands, and arms hacked from the shoulders, and human bones wrapped in loose flesh. The graves were skillfully concealed under layers of trash. The bodies had all been subjected to a gruesome and uniform fate. Decapitated, arms removed at the shoulders, and legs severed at the knees. Skulls displayed signs of blunt trauma and deep gashes likely caused during the violent acts. The Chicago Tribune reported that the bones had been deliberately crushed with hammers after the dismemberment and quicklime had been used to further obscure the identities of the victims. Among the remains, they found the body of Jenny Olson, Belle Gunness's foster daughter, who had vanished months earlier under the pretext of leaving for school in California. Additionally, the small bodies of two unidentified children were discovered. As the digging continued, the tally of bodies rose exponentially. By the second day, they had found the remains of 11 victims, and with no end in sight, the police eventually stopped counting. As the investigators stood before the haunting scene, a chilling realization took hold. This was no ordinary family cemetery. It was a macabre mass grave shrouded in unsettling secrets. Those acquainted with Mrs. Gunness's peculiar matrimonial advertisements immediately recognized the grim truth concealed within the bones. 
the scenes of horror attracted large crowds, with up to 15,000 people gathered to witness the grim spectacle. Refreshment stands were set up, and spectators could bizarrely purchase Gunner's stew as they watched the unsettling events unfold. Delving deeper into the investigation, the police unraveled a disturbing tale of a woman leading a double life as a serial killer. Belle Gunness, the mastermind behind the sinister scheme, cunningly lured unsuspecting bachelors through her cleverly placed newspaper ads. Once she identified the perfect target, she skillfully coaxed him into journeying to the town of Laporte, where her true intentions lay in wait. With honeyed words and charm, she ensnared her victims, manipulating them into revealing their life savings. Once the unsuspecting victim handed over the substantial sum, he met a gruesome fate at her hands. These macabre discoveries shattered the previous perception of Belle Gunness as a praiseworthy woman who tragically perished in the fire while attempting to save her children. Shortly after the discovery of Belle Gunness and the extent of her murderous deeds, the news swiftly circulated, capturing public attention. Various newspapers were quick to coin catchy monikers for her, such as the Indiana Ogress, the La Porte Cool, the Mistress of the Castle of Death, and Hell's Princess. The shocking revelations led to an influx of inquiries from families of missing men who hoped to find answers about their loved ones' fates. However, despite initial attempts at identification, most of the remains could not be conclusively linked to specific individuals, leaving countless families without closure and adding to the tragic legacy of the heinous crimes. On May 19, 1908, a significant discovery came to light amidst the rubble of the Gunness home, a piece of bridge work revealing two human canine teeth still attached to their roots, porcelain teeth and gold crown work nestled in between. Dr. Norton identified the dental work as that of Gunness. With the dental revelation in hand, Coroner Charles Mack officially drew his conclusion. The adult female body found within the ruins belonged to none other than Belle Gunness, laying to rest one aspect of the haunting enigma. However, skepticism clouded the minds of many. Gossips whispered tales of neighbors who had glimpsed the charred remains, expressing doubt that the short and skinny body could possibly be that of their towering neighbor, known to be a woman of substantial weight. Doubts loomed, and curious reporters couldn't help but speculate on a chilling possibility. What if the cunning serial killer had orchestrated a ruse? Could she have set her house ablaze? deliberately removed her dental bridges to throw off the authorities and vanished into thin air. Whispers of an alternative theory began to spread, suggesting that the remains might have belonged to a recently hired housekeeper, further enshrouding the mystery in ambiguity. Nevertheless, the determined police persisted in their pursuit of justice, their focus now directed towards Ray Lamphere, who faced charges of arson and murder. Evidence mounted against him, indicating his proximity to the Gunness residence on the morning of the destructive fire. Ray Lamphere was arrested on May 22, 1908, and tried for murder and arson. He denied the charges of arson and murder that were filed against him. His defense hinged on the assertion that the body was not Gunness's. Lamphere's lawyer, Wirt Worden, presented evidence challenging Norton's identification of the dental bridge work. A local jeweler testified that the gold in a bridge work remained almost undamaged despite the fire, unlike other gold items. Local doctors conducted experiments with a similar dental bridge work in a blacksmith's forge, showing real teeth crumbling and porcelain teeth damaged, contrary to the evidence used to identify gunness. Testimonies from Joe Maxson, the farmhand and another man, suggested the possibility of the bridge work being planted. On January 14, 1910, Reverend E. A. Shell revealed a confession made by Lamphere while he was on his deathbed. Lamphere disclosed Gunness's crimes and claimed she was still alive. According to Lamphere, he hadn't committed the murders himself, but had assisted Gunness in burying her victims. Gunness would welcome her victims warmly, offering a large meal before drugging their coffee and attacking them. Sometimes she used chloroform while they slept. Afterward, she dismembered the bodies, as she learned from her butcher husband, Peter Gunness, and buried the remains in the hog pen or around the house. She occasionally poisoned victims with strychnine and fed some of the remains to the hogs. Lamphere provided crucial insights into the enigma of the headless female corpse discovered amidst Gunness's burned home. 
Gunnis had enticed this woman from Chicago, supposedly offering her a job as a housekeeper. Shortly before her planned escape from La Porte, Gunnis drugged and killed the woman, mutilating her body and disposing of the head in a swamp with weights tied to it. Her own children met a tragic fate, being chloroformed, smothered and left in the basement alongside the headless corpse. In a cunning attempt to deceive authorities, Gunnis dressed the female corpse in her own clothes and removed her false teeth, ensuring the body would be identified as Belle Gunnis. With the house engulfed in flames, she made her escape. Lamphere asserted that Gunnis was driven to stage her death and flee because of Asley Helgelian's imminent visit to search for his brother on the farm. Evidence emerged that Belle Gunness had withdrawn a substantial amount of money from her bank accounts before the fire, adding weight to the theory of a premeditated escape. While Lamphere admitted to aiding her, she ultimately betrayed him by slipping away and vanishing into the woods, deviating from their original plan to flee together. There are accounts suggesting Lamphere may have escorted her to Stillwell, bidding her farewell as she boarded a train bound for Chicago. According to Lamphere, Gunnis was a wealthy woman who had murdered at least 42 men, possibly more, and extorted sums ranging from $1,000 to $32,000 from them. Her murder schemes had amassed a staggering fortune of over $250,000, a considerable sum for those times, equivalent to about $9.3 million in today's dollars. Although she had a small amount left in one of her savings accounts, local banks confirmed that she had withdrawn most of her funds shortly before the fire. This suggested her intent to escape and evade the law. Lamphere faced a conviction for arson, but was acquitted of murder. He was sentenced to serve 20 years in prison and succumbed to tuberculosis on December 30, 1909. Belle Gunness, a figure shrouded in terror, seemed to leave her haunting presence in various parts of the country. Witnesses reported sightings of her in the woods of La Porte, amidst the bustling streets of Chicago, and even aboard a train bound for Rochester, New York. Even as late as 1931, claims persisted that Gunnis was living in a Mississippi town, supposedly owning significant property and leading a prominent life. Although the bodies of Gunnis's three children were discovered in the ruins of her home, the identity of the headless adult female corpse found alongside them remained a mystery. Laporte residents were divided in their beliefs, with some thinking she was killed by Lamphere while others speculated she had orchestrated her own demise. In an eerie turn of events, a woman named Esther Carlson was arrested in Los Angeles in 1931 for poisoning a Norwegian-American man for monetary gain. Curiously, she bore a striking resemblance to Gunnis and even possessed a photograph of children bearing a striking resemblance to Gunnis's own offspring. The enigma of Bella Gunnis continues to intrigue with questions lingering about her true fate and the extent of her sinister legacy. The body believed to be Belle Gunnis's was laid to rest next to her first husband at Forest Husband at Forest Home Cemetery in Forest Park, Illinois. In an effort to uncover her true identity, on November 5, 2007, the headless body was exhumed from Gunnis's grave at Forest Home Cemetery. A team of forensic anthropologists and graduate students from the University of Indianapolis conducted the exhumation with the permission of Belle's sister's descendants. Their hope was to find enough DNA on a sealed envelope flap discovered at the victim's farm to compare it to that of the body. However, the DNA found was insufficient, leading to ongoing efforts to locate a reliable source for comparison. This includes the potential disinterment of additional bodies and contacting known living relatives. Following the exposure of Gunness's heinous crimes, her farm transformed into a morbid tourist attraction drawing visitors from all corners of the nation eager to witness the site of the mass graves. Souvenirs and concessions catering to this macabre fascination were readily available. Additionally, the impact of her crimes on the local area was significant, as evidenced by the Laporte County Historical Society Museum, which now houses a permanent exhibit dedicated to Belle Gunness and her dark legacy. Furthermore, Gunness's chilling tale has inspired the creation of at least two American musical ballads, solidifying her infamy in popular culture. The exploration of the Belle Gunness case has left an indelible impression on our understanding of human behavior and the darker aspects of society. The study of her tactics, charm, and manipulation evokes a mixture of fascination and horror, underscoring the significance of being cautious when trusting others and remaining vigilant about potential dangers 
The case also underscores the importance of acknowledging the potential for evil within human nature, necessitating an ongoing examination of the factors that drive individuals to commit such atrocities. Delving into the historical context of the Bell Gunners case reveals the limitations of early 20th century law enforcement and investigative methods. This reflection emphasizes the necessity of continuous progress in criminology and forensic science to stay ahead of those who would perpetrate such crimes. Moreover, it raises awareness about the ethical considerations surrounding the portrayal of true crime in the media, calling for a balanced approach that educates the public without glorifying the actions of criminals. In conclusion, the Bell Gunness case remains a haunting illustration of humanity's darkest facets. Its historical significance urges us to reflect on the complexity of human behavior the importance of enhancing investigative methods and the necessity of remaining vigilant to prevent future atrocities. Remembering the victims and their families remains crucial as society endeavors to learn from the past and protect against similar tragedies in the future. Thanks for watching. If you found this video fascinating, don't forget to like, subscribe and share. Let us know in the comments if there are any other unsolved mysteries you'd like us to explore. And as always, prioritize your safety. Until next time.